But I would just like to welcome all of you to this uh, wonderful event. We're absolutely delighted that the esteemed members of our faculty will be making a number of significant contributions. We're going to be taping all of them on the newest saint in the Catholic Church, John Henry Cardinal Newman. Uh, as you know, many of our Rome students were present on that day for the actual canonization. And it was a great day for the church, great day for the, the Catholic Church in England. Uh, but that intellectual patrimony is something that we hope will continue to be explored. Hopefully the canonization will be the first step to what I hope eventually will be John Henry Cardinal Newman, Doctor of Conscience. And I think that would be a great thing to see a great title for him to have uh, within the church. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over now uh, to Mark Rolano, who will introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell. Welcome to Christendom College's St. John Newman Lecture Series. Primarily for those watching on videotape, uh, I'm Mark Rolina, the Executive Vice President of the College. Let us begin with a prayer, one of St. John Newman's own. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. May the Lord support us all the day long, till the shades lengthen and the evening comes, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then in his mercy, may he give us a safe lodging and holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. St. John Henry Newman. A quick word on the inspiration for this series. Uh, members of the faculty and administration came together to consider how to best mark the canonization of this great man. This lecture series was viewed as an important way to commemorate the extraordinary life and contributions of John Henry Cardinal Newman. Throughout the next four days, we will hear thoughtful reflections from our excellent faculty on the life, influences, and impact of this great saint. And it is fitting that Christendom College, an institution very much formed in the spirit of Newman's idea of a university, should seek to foster deeper understanding of and reflection on his life. And we are in for a treat today as Dr. Adam Schwartz will start us off. Particularly for those who will be watching this as a recording, Dr. Schwartz is a professor of history at Christendom. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Marquette and both his MA and PhD from Northwestern University. Dr. Schwartz's expertise is in 20th century Christian thought. He is an excellent teacher and has been regularly published in a broad range of journals and publications. He's also the author of the book, The Third Spring, G.K. Chesterton, Graham Greene, Christopher Dawson, and David Jones. He serves or has served on various boards and editorial boards, including for a number of organizations and publications dedicated to the works of C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. Today, Dr. Schwartz will be giving a lecture entitled, A Stern Necessity, Newman's Conversion to Roman Catholicism. Please welcome to the podium, Dr. Adam Schwartz. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I want to thank, first of all, everyone who is here. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful October day uh, when you could be doing a lot of other things, so thank you for being here. A um, couple of thank yous before I get started more broadly or more narrowly, actually. Uh, the first is to Mark Rolina. Uh, thank you for your support of this lecture series. Uh, Mr. Rolino was very instrumental in bringing this into being from a kind of inchoate idea some of us on the faculty had. He really helped shape the form of it. And it's really wonderful, as Dr. O'Donnell said, to see the faculty and administration coming together in their support and uh, commemoration of Newman's canonization, because uh, this is a momentous event for the whole life of the church and for the whole life of our college. Uh, the other person I want to thank specifically is Dr. Bursnack, Dr. Bracey Bursnack, who uh, really, from the faculty side, really was a terrific liaison uh, with the administration, really helped to recruit some of the speakers for this series, and did this all when he's supposed to be on sabbatical and uh, really took time out of his, his precious free time uh, to help construct this event. Uh, it wouldn't, what we're seeing over the next few days would not have happened without these two men, so I'm very, very grateful to them. Uh, as we start this week of commemorations of Newman's canonization, I need to start by doing something that historians do really well. I need to start by stating the obvious. Uh, the obvious thing I need to state is this, uh, that John Henry Newman would not be a canonized saint if he were not a Roman Catholic. That's pretty obvious. 
What is not so obvious, however, is that for half of his life, John Henry Newman was not a Roman Catholic. And so that's what I want to explore with you today. I want to look at the circumstances of his conversion to Roman Catholicism, and in doing so, look more broadly at the history of modern British religious history in the 19th century, uh, particularly what was happening in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Church of England. Uh, so it's kind of an interweaved narrative that we'll be exploring with Newman as the focus, but seeing him in this larger historical perspective. Okay, so to start by thinking about Roman Catholicism in uh, the modern period. Since the time of the Reformation in England, so starting with Henry VIII, from that point on, Roman Catholics steadily became what the historian Edward Norman calls a rejected minority. So they faced persecution, they faced marginalization, and by the time we're getting to the late 18th century, Catholics, Roman Catholics in England, are only about 10% of the population. Uh, so this is a group that is very much on the margins of society. But starting in the late 18th century, the fortunes of British Roman Catholics started to enjoy something of an upswing. And so that's the first thing we need to understand, is what's happening with the Roman Catholic community in the late 18th century as we start towards the turn into the 19th century. Uh, this upswing in Catholic fortunes was due largely to a couple of misunderstandings on the part of what was going on in the Catholic community by the larger British population, but these were fortunate misunderstandings. Uh, so let me elucidate that. The first thing that was happening was that in the late 18th century, British Roman Catholics were starting to emphasize the rational side of Catholicism over the more, shall we say, spiritual side of Catholicism. As we all know, Catholicism is a blend of faith and reason. And throughout at different points in its history, uh, the Catholic Church in different places has sometimes emphasized faith more, sometimes emphasized reason more. Not to the exclusion of the other, but it's a matter of emphasis. And so in the late 18th century, that's what starts happening in the Catholic Church in Britain. The rational side of Catholicism starts to be emphasized more. So there's more attention to theological studies, especially moral theology, and there's a downplaying of more of the, what we could call faith side, uh, devotional practices, the cult of the saints, veneration of relics, things like that. These things were still happening, but the primary emphasis was on the more rational faith uh, reason side of Catholicism. Okay, so that happens historically. This balance kind of tilts one way or the other. It's tilting more towards reason in the late 18th century. The way in which this was misunderstood by non-Catholic Britons was this. The late 18th century is the heyday of the Enlightenment, often called the Age of Reason. And so what non-Catholic Britons perceived, wrongly, but they perceived, was that Catholics were becoming rationalistic, that they were starting to embrace unaided reason as opposed to reason in balance with faith, and thus were get, putting aside their sort of superstitious practices, they were becoming more like the mainstream intellectually and were becoming more reasonable, more rational, and thus more like the rest of society. Now that's not what Catholics were doing. They were emphasizing reason in a very different way than the enlightened idea of unaided reason. It was always reason in tandem with faith. But that misunderstanding redounded to Catholics' benefits because it broke down some of the prejudice against Catholics that had existed about them being these kind of people who followed these weird superstitious practices and thus made them seem more normal and thus tolerance for Catholics started to grow. So that's the first thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening in the Catholic community is that there's a growing amount of grumbling about what they saw as the heavy hand of Rome over the English church. And to understand this, we need to know that since the time of Queen Elizabeth, so this is going back to the 16th century, the Catholic Church in Britain had been considered missionary territory, so it did not have a hierarchy of bishops. It was ruled directly from Rome. And by the late 18th century, uh, British Catholics were starting to chafe at that direct rule from Rome. They were starting to feel that Rome had often misunderstood the cultural context in Britain, didn't really know the um, ins and outs of Catholic life in Britain, their relationship to the state, and were questioning Rome's prudential judgment. So they were still accepting Rome's spiritual authority. That was never in question. It was Rome's prudential judgment as the direct ruler of the church in Britain that they were questioning. 
but this was another subtlety that was lost on non-Catholic Britons. Non-Catholic Britons saw Roman Catholics as finally throwing off their allegiance to a foreign potentate. And this had been one of the big prejudices against Catholics in Britain up until this time. Catholics were guilty of dual loyalty, that their loyalty to the Pope was greater than their loyalty to the crown. And so when they hear Catholics grumbling about the papacy's prudential judgment, they think, good. Catholics now finally understand they shouldn't be enthralled to this autocrat in Rome. They're now politically reliable citizens. And so therefore, we don't have to distrust them politically anymore. We can start to treat them more like fellow British subjects. So these are two big misunderstandings that's going on of what's happening in the internal dynamics of the Catholic community, but it has beneficial effects. So it's kind of a creative misunderstanding that's beneficial to Catholics. Because this greater tolerance for Roman Catholics results in some very important legislation in the late 18th century. Uh, both in 1778 and then again in 1791, the British Parliament passes laws guaranteeing the property rights of Catholics in Britain. And this was a huge step forward because since Reformation times, especially since Henry VIII's confiscation of the monasteries, Catholic property rights had not been guaranteed in law. Now they were. And so that's a big step forward for Catholic acceptance in the larger society. And so, as we get to the turn of the century, as we now get into the 19th century, Catholics are feeling buoyed by these gains. They're feeling we've had our property rights restored, our economic rights restored, now we want our political rights restored. Because another aspect of being a rejected minority is that at this point in history, the 19th century, Catholics could not vote and they could not serve in Parliament. But with their economic rights restored, Catholics now start putting on a push for what they called full emancipation, the right to vote and the right to serve in parliament. And so that's becoming their consuming goal during the first part of the 19th century. How do we bring about this restoration of our political rights to match the restoration of our economic rights? So Catholicism is growing in favor. It's starting to be tolerated more, starting to be respected more. And it's not only in the larger British society or in the Roman Catholic Church that Catholicism is growing. It's also starting to grow in the Church of England. Okay, a little bit of background on the Church of England as it stood at this time. Since the time of Queen Elizabeth, so going again back to the 16th century, the Church of England had been a hybrid form of Christianity. It had been Catholic in its structure. So it had priests, bishops, and then a supreme governor of the church. Of course, that's the monarch, not the pope. But it's still a hierarchical structure. So it follows the Catholic model ecclesiologically. But theologically, the Church of England since the time of Queen Elizabeth was Protestant. So on all the controverted issues between Catholics and Protestants, it had taken the Protestant position. And this, what was called the Elizabethan settlement, was done so deliberately to provide this hybrid form of Christianity Catholic in structure, Protestant in doctrine, in order to provide a church that could appeal to a broad range of English people. And so that's the way the Church of England still was at the turn of the 19th century, Catholic in structure, Protestant in doctrine. But what starts to happen in the 1820s is that a group of scholars at the University of Oxford begin calling for a change in this model of the church. They want to retain the Catholic structure but these scholars at the University of Oxford now want to start introducing Catholic theology into the Church of England. And because this movement uh, towards a more Catholic Anglicanism uh, comes, at the comes in the University of Oxford, it becomes known as the Oxford Movement. And I'm going to say a little bit about this, but I'm going to save most of that for Dr. Lane's talk later in the week just to give you a little bit of sense of where this fits into our story. Uh, the members of the Oxford movement wrote their vision of a Catholic Anglicanism in a series of pamphlets or tracts called the Tracts for the Times. And thus, the Oxford movement is often referred to interchangeably as the Tractarians. And so I'll be using those terms interchangeably. If you read the literature of this, you see them used interchangeably. So the Oxford movement, the Tractarians, same goal, 
trying to achieve a more Catholic theology in the Church of England. Okay. Who are the principal Tractarians? The leaders of the Oxford movement were primarily three people. Uh, the first was a man named John Keeble, uh, who's credited with launching the Oxford movement with a sermon he gave in 1833. Uh, that's the same year the Tracts for the Times began. The second principal figure in the Oxford movement and its theological architect was a man named R.H. Frode. Uh, Frode actually died quite young. He died in 1836, but laid a lot of the theological foundation during the 20s and early 30s for what the Tractarians would do. And the third uh, and the eventual, the leading spokesman of the Oxford movement was John Henry Newman. You probably wondered when I was going to mention him. Okay, so let's get up to speed on Newman as he now comes on to the scene. Uh, John Henry Newman was born in 1801. He was the eldest of six children and came from a middle class family. And like many middle class families of the time, their adherence to Christianity was quite superficial. So young John Henry Newman was um, educated in the basics of Christianity, but his training didn't go very deep. Also, like many middle class families, uh, the Newmans sent their children off to boarding school at a very young age. And so in 1808, uh, young John Henry was sent to Ealing Public School, and that is where his intellectual and religious formation continued. He's at Elaine for almost 10 years. He's going to be there until 1817. So this is his formative period intellectually and in some ways spiritually. Because as John Henry Newman grew into adolescence, uh, his rather tepid, superficial Christianity uh, was brought into question by his very powerful intellect. Remember I told you this was the heyday of the Enlightenment. So Newman starts reading Enlightenment thinkers as an early adolescent at Ealing, particularly Tom Paine and David Hume both of whom were very strict opponents of traditional Christianity. So Newman starts embracing this Enlightenment rationalism that I talked to you about earlier. And this is now what is shaping his mind as an adolescent. One of his teachers at Ealing, a man named Walter Mayers, noticed this development in Newman and was alarmed by it. Because Mayers was a devout Christian. And so he kind of took Newman under his wing and gave him theological instruction to counter Newman's reading of Enlightenment thinkers. And the kind of Christianity that Mayers exposed Newman to was a kind of evangelical Calvinism. Uh, so it was the kind of religion that very much emphasized the importance of scripture, emphasized a distrust of natural processes like reason. So it was almost a perfect counterstatement to the Enlightenment emphasis on unaided reason and on following one's natural reason that Newman was so absorbed in. So this very different approach to, the, to thinking and believing kind of shocked Newman out of his Enlightenment rationalism and it was into this evangelical Calvinism uh, that Newman moved by the end of his time at Ely. And it was possessing these Christian beliefs, this kind of evangelical Calvinism, uh, that Newman took with him when in 1817 he went up to Trinity College at the University of Oxford. Uh, Newman had a distinguished academic career as an undergraduate, and in 1822, he was invited to be a fellow at Oriel College, also at Oxford. And so he joins the faculty at Oxford. Uh, all this time, Newman had been discerning a vocation to the Anglican priesthood, and in 1825, he was ordained a priest in the Church of England. And it was at this same point, 1820s, that Newman started moving away from the evangelical Catholicism he learned from Mayers and more towards an appreciation of Catholic theology. And there's three main reasons for this. Uh, the first is that of the major universities in England, Oxford was the one that had historically always been the most hospitable to Catholicism. So even when Catholicism was um, not in such a good situation in other parts of the country, there were a strong Catholic intellectual presence at Oxford. So Newman, as a student there, as a faculty member there, is absorbing Catholicism as part of the intellectual and religious atmosphere of the university. So he's really being exposed to Catholicism in a thoughtful and sustained way for the first time. Secondly, another important mentor emerges. Uh, at Oxford, he came under the influence of a teacher named Richard Waitley. 
Uh, Waitley was a committed Catholic in his theology. He's one of these people who was trying to move the Church of England in a more Catholic direction, and he's now started to help shape Newman's mind, help to move him away from evangelical Calvinism towards a greater understanding of what Catholics believed theologically. And one crucial element in that process, and it's something the other members of the Oxford Movement were going through too, was that Newman started studying the Church Fathers. He began to develop a strong appreciation for the patristic tradition. And this study of Newman's began around 1827, and so it's as the 1820s are ending, as we're getting into the 1830s, that inspired by the patristics, Newman and his fellow Tractarians are calling for a new model of the Church of England. And what they're calling for is a Church of England that would retain its Catholic structure, but would now theologically emphasize the importance of Catholic theology, the need for dogma, and the importance of authority. So there's a couple of things that are going on in the inspiration for this model. The first is a positive vision of what they want the Church of England to be, what the Tractarians want the Church of England to be, and the second is a reaction against an intellectual trend of their time. So there's, this helps us understand why the Oxford Movement emerges when it does. The positive vision of the Church that the Tractarians proposed was what they called a via media, a middle way or a way between what they saw as the existing forms of Christianity. The Tractarians were very critical of Protestantism uh, because they believed that Protestantism, as it were, didn't have enough Christianity in it. They felt that the Protestants, in relying on sola scriptura, were ignoring crucial aspects of the Christian heritage, particularly the Church Fathers, the patristics. So they felt that Protestantism was deficient. However, the Tractarians believed that Roman Catholicism had, as it were, too much Christianity in it. They thought that the Roman Catholic Church had added on doctrines illicitly since patristic times, particularly teachings concerning Mary, but not just those, other things as well. So they thought Roman Catholicism, Protestantism is defective, Roman Catholicism is excessive. It's teaching things that are not valid Christianity. So for the Tractarians, their authority in religious matters was not just scripture as it was for the Protestants, nor was it the Roman magisterium as it is for Roman Catholics, it was the church fathers, it was the patristics. And in fact, Newman articulated this very clearly uh, when he said that Rome's flaw, in his mind, was that, quote, it substitutes the authority of the church for that of antiquity. So for Newman, for the Tractarians, it's antiquity, it's apostolic and patristic teaching, that's the authority that determines valid Christianity. So that's the positive vision. A church, unlike any other that currently existed, they thought, that was Catholic in theology, grounded in the patristics, and didn't have the deficiencies of Protestantism or the excesses of Roman Catholicism. It's kind of like the Goldilocks approach to religion, it's just right. <laughs> So that's the positive inspiration. The negative inspiration, as it were, the thing that the Tractarians were reacting against was the rise of, during this period, of an intellectual movement called liberalism. And before I proceed further with this, we need to divest ourselves of the normal connotations of that term. Normally when we hear the word liberal, we think of someone who's left of center politically. That's not primarily the kind of liberalism the Tractarians were talking about. What they were talking about was a philosophical and theological set of uh, principles that they became strongly opposed to. For the Tractarians, liberalism was, in Newman's famous phrase, the anti-dogmatic principle. The anti-dogmatic principle. And what Newman meant by that is this, that for a liberal, at least a liberal of this sort, 19th century liberal, Liberals of this time believed there was objective truth. However, they felt that that truth must be reached by each person through the exercise of his or her free reason. That there was no external source of truth. There was nothing that could speak dogmatically 
to a person about what was true. And so for a liberal, the way you attain truth was not by relying on dogma from external agency, it was through your free reasoning process, that's what would lead you to objective truth. Now Newman felt that there were certain crucial implications to this anti-dogmatic principle. First of all, he thought that the anti-dogmatic principle bred a disregard for authority. Because in liberalism, every person is his own authority. It's very individualistic. It asserts that through the use of your free reason, you discover what the truth is, and so you don't derive that authority from another, you're your own authority. Similarly, uh, Newman felt that liberalism bred a disregard for precedent. And if you don't like precedent, think tradition. Because for a liberal, tradition is simply data. It's simply you investigate to try to discover what is true and good, but it has no prescriptive value. It should not be privileged in your deliberations. There should not be deference to the way things have been done in the past. And so for a liberal, tradition, precedent, has no special value in weighing what's good and true. And so it, in Newman's words, it breed, liberalism breeds a disregard for precedent. And thirdly, Newman thought that liberalism bred what he called a naive dream of our race's progress and perfectibility. And by race here, he obviously means the human race. A fundamentally naive dream of our race's progress and perfectibility. Because for a liberal, the source of human unhappiness is something external to human nature. It's something outside of man. The thing frustrating people's happiness, a liberal says, is dogma. It's this imposition of what's good and true from the outside. So when dogma is dispensed with, a liberal would contend, that is when intellectual progress can be made as people freely reason to what is true. That's why it's called liberalism, it's emphasizing freedom. And that with that free reasoning, that's what produces human flourishing. Now the Tractarians became the fiercest critics of liberalism of their time because the Tractarians very much believed in the dogmatic principle that there is an external source of truth that does tell us what is good and true and that we use our freedom to conform to. And so the Tractarians professed a great regard for authority. They're looking to an external source for knowledge of what's good and true. And that authority for them, as we've already seen, is precedent, it's tradition. It's looking to the patristics, to the church fathers. And to Newman and the Tractarians, that is what would promote human flourishing. Because to say that people through their free reason can discover what is true, the Tractarians believed, ignored the fact, as they saw it, of original sin. That human nature unaided cannot attain fulfillment. That it needs to be guided by dogma, by authority, by tradition, to guide the use of freedom so that it conforms to revealed truth. And so for the Tractarians, Catholicism and liberalism are counterstatements to each other. And therefore, in their minds, a Catholic Anglicanism was necessary, not just as a positive vision of the church, but to combat the growing presence of liberalism within the British society. So for them, Catholicism and liberalism are at odds. Which makes it all the more interesting and ironic that the growth of liberalism actually helped to promote the fortunes of British Roman Catholics. So we come back to this part of the story. Uh, as I told you before, during the 1820s, during the 19th century, but coming into the 1820s, British Roman Catholics are pushing for full emancipation, the right to vote, the right to serve in Parliament. In 1829, the British Parliament passed a law granting Catholic emancipation. So in 1829, Catholics gained the right to vote. They gained the right to vote to serve in Parliament. Now remember, there's no Catholics in Parliament. So why is a non-Catholic Parliament granting Catholics their political rights? A big reason for that is the influence of liberalism. Because British liberals, many of whom were now in Parliament, came to the conclusion 
that if a Catholic uses his free reason to discover what's good and true, he might be wrong. He might not have attained objective truth yet. But because he's acted according to his free reason, sincerely, there can be no bar to his participation in public life. Because we don't believe in dogma. There's no dogmatic basis for saying Catholics are wrong and therefore exclude them from the public sphere. All people have to be respect, all beliefs have to be respected. And therefore, what people arrive at through their free reasoning has to be tolerated. And therefore, if we have to tolerate one's free reasoning, and one's free reasoning says Catholicism is true, you can't bar people from public office because of that. So as at odds as Catholicism and liberalism are philosophically, theologically, the presence of liberalism in the British public mind leads to political emancipation for British Roman Catholics. And so it's another one of these, in a sense, misunderstandings that redounds to Catholics' benefits. And it is a benefit. This is a watershed moment in British Catholic history. And following it, Catholics are feeling very confident, really for the first time in centuries because they're feeling we've had our economic rights restored, 18th century, we've now had our political rights restored. And so the kind of really dire persecution and marginalization we'd been undergoing for centuries, that's over. And so Catholics now start thinking, we now have a more or less regular relationship with the British state, so why can't we have a regular relationship with the universal church? After all, the only reason we've been ruled directly from Rome is because we've been in this state of persecution, marginalization. That doesn't obtain anymore. So as we now move into the 1830s and 1840s, the main push amongst British Catholics is for a restoration of a hierarchy of bishops to establish a normal relationship between the British church and the Roman church. So this is something all Catholics want in the 1830s and 40s. They all want a restoration of the hierarchy. However, they want it for utterly opposed reasons. Imagine that, Catholics arguing about something. Okay. So there's two schools of thought that emerge. Remember, they want the same thing, restoration of the hierarchy. Two schools of thought emerge as to why. One group was called the Cisalpine. And these are people who looked to this side of the Alps, in other words, to Britain, as the locus of the relationship between the British and universal churches. The Cisalpines believed that we should have a restoration of the hierarchy so that the bishops could serve as a kind of buffer between the British church and the universal church. So these are the kind of people we saw grumbling in the late 18th century, the people who felt Rome's hand had been too heavy, we recognized its spiritual authority, but they don't understand our cultural context, they make bad prudential judgments. A restoration of the hierarchy then would put bishops in place who understood the British cultural context and who could thus shield the British Catholics from mistakes Rome might otherwise make. So the Cisalpines want the bishops to serve as a kind of buffer. That's one group. At the other end of the spectrum, people also want a restoration of the hierarchy but these people were called the Ultramontanes because they looked beyond the mountains. They looked to Rome as the locus of the relationship between the British and universal churches. Now the Ultramontanes acknowledged that there had been tensions between the British church and the universal church, but they regretted that. Uh, they felt it was all a lot of misunderstandings. And so they wanted a restoration of the hierarchy so that the bishops could serve as kinds of translators. Being British, they would understand the state of the British church and be able to communicate that to Rome. But being appointed by Rome, they would also understand Rome's perspective, they'd understand the Vatican's position, and be able to communicate that to their fellow British Catholics. And so the bishops in this model, the Ultramontane model, would smooth out these kind of differences that had obstructed harmonious relations between the two churches, the British Church and the Universal Church, and would promote a harmonious, close relationship rather than a distant one. So utterly different perspectives on the same goal. As it turns out, uh, it's the ultramontane vision that is going to prevail. And that was principally due to the work of a man named Nicholas Wiseman. 
Uh, Wiseman was sort of the epitome of ultramontanism in his profile. He was a Catholic priest, born and bred in Britain, so British Catholic. But he was someone who spent a lot of time in Rome, educated there, spent almost 20 years of his life on and off in Rome. So he knew the British Catholic milieu, he knew the Vatican milieu, he wanted to bring them together. And it was due to Wiseman's efforts primarily that in 1850, Pope Pius IX has restored a hierarchy of bishops in Britain. And so the goal of the Catholic community is accomplished in 1850, there's a restoration of the hierarchy. Now that meant, that restoration of the hierarchy meant that new bishops had to be appointed. And in particular, there's a new primal see, the Archbishop of Westminster, and anybody want to guess who gets to be the Archbishop of Westminster? It's Nicholas Wiseman. So he's rewarded for his efforts to restore the hierarchy by getting the first primal see. And Wiseman, upon taking on that see, announces a, a very new vision of the Catholic Church in Britain. Because, as we've seen, uh, since the time of the Reformation, uh, British Catholics had been primarily pragmatic in their orientation. They just wanted to survive in a hostile environment. So they hadn't been particularly concerned with ecclesiastical matters. As we've seen, they wanted a distant relationship from Rome. They were kind of cruel to Rome. And as we also saw, they favored a kind of accommodation or at least seeking points of contact with the larger culture, not compromising their principles, but trying to adapt their style. Wiseman, however, as the new primate of England, announces a very different model of Catholicism. For him, he wanted the church in England to no longer be solely pragmatic, so worried about survival, but to be more confident and to be more focused on a hierarchical relationship, a close relationship to Rome, and especially for emphasizing the way Catholics were different from the rest of British society, the kind of distinctive role they could play, the particular contribution they could make, rather than trying to sink those differences so that they wouldn't be persecuted. And this more hierarchical, more confident version of Catholicism is the vision of Catholicism that would prevail in Britain for the next more than a century. So it's this kind of Catholicism that's drawing greater attention as we get to the middle part of the century, and it was not unnoticed elsewhere in the country. Because at the same time the movement toward the restoration of the hierarchy was taking place in the Roman Catholic Church. The Oxford movement was exerting a great influence and causing a lot of controversy in the Church of England. During the 1830s, uh, the Oxford movement and its vision of a more Catholic Anglicanism was attracting a growing number of adherents. And John Henry Newman had a lot to do with this. Newman was an outstanding preacher and he was regularly drawing people to sermons every Sunday at St. Mary the Virgin where he would articulate different aspects of this Catholic theology and this opened up a whole new way of thinking about Christianity for many Oxford uh, students, other people from throughout the country. So this vision of a more Catholic Anglicanism is getting traction in the 1830s and therefore it's starting to uh, ex exact resistance, excite resistance from much of the Anglican establishment. Because many of the bishops, many of the Anglican officials at Oxford didn't want a more Catholic Anglicanism. They liked the Elizabethan settlement. Catholic in structure, yes, but Protestant in doctrine. So this call for a more Catholic Anglicanism was bringing the members of the Oxford movement into growing controversy with many of their overseers in the Church of England and throughout the country. And this controversy came to a head in 1841. In 1841, John Henry Newman published the 90th in that series of tracts for the Times. So it's tract number 90. And tract number 90 dealt with the 39 articles. And what the 39 articles were, this went all the way back to the time of Queen Elizabeth, were 39 statements of faith and practice that were the bedrock of Anglican orthodoxy. So if you were ordained as an Anglican priest, you had to swear you believed in the 39 Articles. If you matriculated at Oxford or Cambridge, you had to swear that you believed in the 39 Articles in order to become a student there. This is the most public, visible statement of what it means to be an Anglican. 
in tract number 90 in 1841, John Henry Newman argued for a Catholic interpretation of the 39 articles. Newman argued that there was a way you could read the 39 articles in a way that was completely compatible with Catholicism. And so he's taking on the fundamental principles of Anglicanism and presenting them in a Catholic light. As you might imagine, this tract sparked a firestorm of controversy. People not only questioned uh, Newman's theology, thinking he got the theology wrong, but they started questioning his and the other Tractarians' motives. They started portraying Newman and the Tractarians as kind of Roman fifth columnists, papist Trojan horses, people who were trying to subtly lead the Church of England towards reunion with Rome, which wasn't their intention. And this controversy became scalding. In fact, in 1841, by the end of the year, the Bishop of Oxford, who was Newman's superior, banned the Tractarians from any further writing. And Newman was so shaken by this that he actually resigned from his duties as a teacher at Oxford and went into semi-retirement at a place called Littlemore, just outside of Oxford. And it was from Littlemore in 1841 that Newman wrote the following to a friend. A great and anxious experiment is going on, whether our church be or be not Catholic. I must be plain in saying that if it does issue in Protestantism, I shall think it my duty to leave it. So by 1841, Newman is convinced, I want Catholicism. This is what we've been all about we thought the Church of England could be brought to this vision of Catholicism, but if it's not, if it's really Protestant, I can't stay in it. And over the next couple of years, uh, these doubts of Newman's about the viability of a Catholic Anglicanism intensified because the Tractarians got more and more criticism. No one in Anglican officialdom stood up for them. No one at Oxford stood up for them. And thus, by 1843, Newman was writing this to another friend. If one thing after another is done against the holders of Catholic doctrines without protest from any quarter, the imagination of certain persons will gradually be affected with the notion that the Church of England does not hold them and is not their place. So in a sense, by 1843, Newman is kind of feeling pushed out of the Church of England because of his Catholic beliefs. And other things are happening at the same time to lead him to rethink the viability of a Catholic Anglicanism. One thing that's happening is Newman's academic work uh, because Newman wasn't just a controversialist. He was also a scholar. And this is what I think Dr. McGuire is going to talk about on Wednesday. As Newman studied the patristics, ancient church history, he came to the conclusion that authentic Christianity was grounded in the apostolic succession. That the church that could trace its lineage directly back to Christ and the apostles, that was the true church. And as he studied early church history, Newman started to notice a pattern. The pattern he noticed was that Roman Catholicism had always kept faith with the apostolic succession. There was always that direct lineage back to Christ and the apostles. But every other Christian movement that emerged at some point broke that communion with Christ and the apostles and forfeited its legitimacy. Now Newman's mind, more than most people's, worked by the principle of analogy, seeing parallels between things. And as he's studying this ancient church history, he's brought up short by a parallel that he now sees to his own time. Because Newman starts to see, by 1843 or so, that Roman Catholicism still has the apostolic succession. It can still trace its lineage directly back to Christ and the apostles. But no other Christian movement can, not even the Church of England. Newman put it this way. What the see of Rome was then, such it is now. What the Monophysites were then, the Anglican hierarchy is now. That ancient history is not dead, it lives. 
If the via media was heretical then, it is heretical now. So this whole project of a Catholic Anglicanism, Newman is starting to believe, isn't viable because it lacks that authenticating connection to Christ and the apostles. Roman Catholicism has that. So Roman Catholicism has historical authenticity. But this raises a big problem in Newman's mind because this is the same church, Roman Catholic Church, that's added on teaching illicitly to the apostolic deposit. So how can this church be historically authentic but not theologically authentic? This doesn't make any sense. So Newman has to start thinking that through. And in doing so, he comes up with what is arguably his most important contribution to theology, his idea of the development of doctrine. Newman starts thinking through this way. Doctrine is fixed, dogma is stable, and it's complete. So it's true, and it's always true. The human mind, however, Newman feels, is limited. And therefore, the human mind cannot absorb the fullness of a doctrine all at once. The fullness of a doctrine has to be unveiled historically. It has to be unveiled over time so that all the full implications of it can be drawn out through study, through theological reflection. And what results is that fullness of truth that's always been present, but that can be only known gradually. So Newman says that's how dogma works. And he then makes this connection. That's what's been happening in the Catholic Church. Throughout its history, the Catholic Church has been unveiling, unfolding that fullness of truth in those dogmas gradually, historically, according to the capacities of the human mind to absorb it. So for Newman, what had originally looked like arbitrary additions to Catholic teaching, he now saw as organic outgrowths as things that were always already there, but that were just being realized through the historical unfolding. And he articulated this breakthrough in 1843 to John Keeble. Quote, Roman additions to the primitive creed are developments arising out of a keen and vivid realizing of the divine deposit of faith. So the divine deposit of faith is stable, but what has happened in the Catholic Church is that there's been a keener and vivid realizing of what's always been there. And so this resolves that contradiction I've noted earlier. Now Newman sees Roman Catholicism as historically authentic and theologically authentic. So by 1843, he's pretty convinced this is the true church. But that's a tough realization because Newman foresees that if he becomes a Roman Catholic, it's gonna be costly emotionally. He's gonna to have to leave Oxford. No sane person wants to do that. <laughs> he foresees being shunned by his fellow Tractarians, people who continue in good faith to believe in the viability of a Catholic Anglicanism. And he's worried that Roman Catholics aren't going to greet him very favorably because he's been a staunch critic of their religion for nearly 20 years. And so this is what's tearing Newman apart. Intellectually, he's drawn to Catholicism. He thinks it's true, Roman Catholicism. Emotionally, it's hard to separate himself from all of these concerns, allegiances, and fears. And so he's grappling with this for the next two years. And he articulated very poignantly these feelings in a letter to his sister of March 1845. What in the world am I doing this for? I have a good name with many. I am deliberately sacrificing it. I have a bad name with more. I am fulfilling all their worst wishes and giving them their most coveted triumph. I am distressing all that I love unsettling all I have instructed, 
I am going to those I do not know and whom, of whom I expect very little. Oh, what can it be but a stern necessity which causes this? But that necessity was stern in Newman's mind. And by October of 1845, he no longer could resist uh, fulfilling that mandate. And in October of 1845, he contacted an Italian, Italian passionate priest, Father Dominic Barberi, and on the 9th of October, 1845, Newman was received into the Catholic Church. A day that he would forever afterwards called my day. It was the turning point of his life. And in fact, when Newman was beatified, the 9th of October was established as his feast day. Not the day he died, but the day he came to spiritual life, as it were, in the Roman Catholic Church. Newman ad accurately foresaw the consequences of his conversion. Intellectually satisfied, very much at peace, but he did have to leave Oxford permanently. He was shunned by his fellow Tractarians. John Keeble, his best friend, didn't talk to him for another 40 years. And he was greeted suspiciously by many of his fellow Catholics. And so that's the last part of the story we're going to look at, is Newman once he becomes Catholic and how his relationship in the church goes. Uh, Newman very much wanted to continue as a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. So he applied for reordination, and after probably the quickest seminary study ever, uh, Newman was ordained a Roman Catholic priest in 1847. In 1849, he saw a way of making, trying to make a distinctive contribution to the church he had just joined when he founded a branch of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in Birmingham, the Birmingham Oratory, uh, where later both J.R.R. Tolkien and Hilaire Belloc would study. So you start to see how these things come together. But even so, even as Newman was trying to find his way in the church, he was encountering a lot of resistance, uh, particularly from people who had been suspicious of him as a critic of the church, uh, people who weren't quite sure where he stood theologically, his idea of development raised some eyebrows. And so Newman's relationship to the church really reached its crisis point, but also its turning point uh, in the 1860s. And the focus of that turning point was the larger debate in the Catholic Church on papal infallibility. Because by the late 1860s, Pope Pius IX was eager to provide a clear definition of papal infallibility. Now this is something that had existed in the church for centuries. People had always had a sense, well, the Pope can speak infallibly. But the parameters of that had not been thoroughly defined. By the 1860s, Pope Pius IX felt it was important to make such a definition for a couple of reasons. First of all, by the late 1860s, the papacy was losing its political control over the papal states in Italy due to Italian unification. And the Pope wanted to try to make some kind of statement that the loss of political authority doesn't mean the loss of spiritual authority. And secondly, uh, Pius IX, just like the Tractarians, uh, was very concerned by the rise of liberalism, this anti-dogmatic principle, this rejection of any kind of external authority. And Pius IX felt that if the church could define the parameters of papal infallibility clearly, uh, that would be a reassertion of the dogmatic principle occasions on which the church could speak dogmatically and thus counter the effects of liberalism. So in 1867, uh, with this end of defining papal infallibility, Pope Pius IX called the First Vatican Council, what became known as the First Vatican Council. And the First Vatican Council, the debate on infallibility, sparked a lot of controversy. And there were several British voices in this debate that represented broader opinion in the church. Uh, one point of view came from the Ultramontanes, uh, people we've met before. And the principal Ultramontane at this point was Henry Edward Manning, uh, who had taken over as Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster after Wiseman's death. Manning wanted a very expansive definition of infallibility to cover faith, to cover morals, but also to cover practical matters, economics, politics, all kinds of prudential judgments. So that's one point of view that was being articulated. At the other end of the spectrum was a point of view represented by the historian Lord Acton, or John Acton, 
who didn't want any definition of papal infallibility because he thought it would be a hindrance to intellectual freedom. And Acton was a strong believer in the importance of freedom. John Henry Newman also weighed in on this debate, but with a typically nuanced position. Newman's perspective on infallibility before the council was what becomes known by the clunky name of the inopportunist. But it does reflect the reality of his position. Unlike Acton, uh, Newman was not opposed to a definition per se. He thought that could be valid. But he thought that the time was not yet right. As he put it, we are not ripe yet for the Pope's infallibility. Newman felt that such a matter would require a great deal of study, a great deal of understanding of history and theology, and therefore needed to be undertaken very carefully to ensure that it was a proper definition. Moreover, uh, Newman was worried by the ultramontane position of an expansive definition of infallibility because Newman felt that that position conflated infallibility with impeccability. That infallibility that had traditionally been seen in faith and morals was now being conflated with the Pope having impeccable judgment in prudential matters. And Newman thought that was a dangerous, historically unwarranted conflation to be making. So he thought we shouldn't define infallibility now. It's too difficult, too thorny an issue. Let's take our time and get it right. However, he wrote to his bishop of Birmingham shortly before the council began saying that if the council did make a decision, uh, he would recognize it, saying this. If it is God's will that the Pope's infallibility should be defined, I shall feel I have but to bow my head to his adorable, inscrutable providence. So the First Vatican Council takes place in 1870. Newman's not there. He's in Birmingham. The definition that the council comes up with is a limited one. It's a definition we still have today, that the Pope can speak infallibly in matters of faith and morals. So Lord Acton is disappointed because he didn't want any definition. Cardinal Manning is also disappointed because it's a very narrow definition. Newman, the inopportunist, is actually pretty happy because the definition is limited. It's what he thought was historically warranted, what he thought had theological uh, cachet, and therefore he's accepting of it, not just on the church's authority, but because he thinks it's a proper decision. The definition of papal infallibility was controversial in the church, as I said, but also outside the church. And in Britain, one of the leading critics of the definition of papal infallibility was the sometime Prime Minister of Britain, William Gladstone. William Gladstone, in addition to being a statesman, was also a theologian. Imagine that. And in 1874, Gladstone wrote an article and then a later pamphlet criticizing the definition of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. Gladstone's not a Catholic, by the way, but he's intervening anyhow. And Gladstone's argument was a very liberal argument uh, in the sense we've been using liberalism that this definition of infallibility is a restriction on intellectual freedom, it shows the Catholic Church just wants to control people's minds, uh, and it's a reintegration of papist prejudice. Now Gladstone, as a statesman, has a pretty high profile, so his views are getting a lot of attention in the British press, in British intellectual life. So the Church in Britain uh, knows these views have to be countered, and they want someone with a similarly high profile to counter them. So they turned to Newman, who is a celebrated author by this time. His work is well known. He has a big megaphone. And it was also known that Newman hadn't favored a de definition of infallibility. So people think, oh, you know, he just went along with it because the church told him to. So a lot of suspicion is still surrounding Newman at this time. In 1874, he accepts the offer to write a response to Gladstone and writes an open letter to the Duke of Norfolk the leading Catholic nobleman. And in that letter to the Duke of Norfolk, Newman defended the decision to declare papal infallibility. And he did so not just because it was the authority of the church, but because of the reasoning behind it. And so he laid this out clearly and articulated, counter to Gladstone, that it really wasn't a frustration of intellectual freedom, but was in fact providing the parameters for the exercise of conscience. <clears throat> 
And with the letter to the Duke of Norfolk, Newman's fortunes among his fellow Catholics started improving drastically. Because he was a known critic of even having a definition, but when he needs to defend the church's decision, he does so with the full force of his theological weight behind him, and this fully established in people's minds at last his bona fides as a Catholic. And thus Newman's position within the church starts improving, and it starts improving rapidly. Five years later, in 1879, a new pope came into office, Pope Leo XIII. And one of the first things Leo XIII did as pope was to create Newman Cardinal. And this was quite rare. Newman's not a bishop. He's a priest. He's not a bishop. But nonetheless, Leo still created him cardinal and actually dispensed with the requirement that he become a titular bishop in Rome. He said, you don't have to do that. And Leo continued to be a staunch advocate of Newman's, uh, frequently referring to him as my cardinal, someone he felt this great intimacy with even though they only met once. So Newman's fortunes are improving, recognized in this unique way by the papacy. Newman died in 1890, but his reputation in the church continued to grow, and particularly in recent times, uh, has reached its culmination. The Second Vatican Council, the seminal event of Catholic life in the modern period, very much bears the imprint of Newman. St. Paul VI, who presided over the end of the Vatican Council and much of its proceedings, in fact declared in 1975 that the Second Vatican Council was, quote, Newman's hour. So the Second Vatican Council, very much under the influence of Newman. And many of the fathers of that council, including the future popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI, had a great admiration for Newman. In fact, in 2010, Newman was beatified. And the circumstances of his beatification in 2010 are also unique. Normally, beatifications take place by the bishop in the diocese of the person being beatified. So in this case, the beatification should have taken place by the Bishop of Birmingham. However, in September of 2010, then Pope Benedict XVI came to Britain to personally beatify Newman, showing his great respect for him and the unique place that Newman had in his thinking and probably in his heart, because this is the only time Benedict did that. It's the only beatification he did. And then, as many of us watched just a couple of weeks ago, in 2019, uh, Newman was formally canonized by Pope Francis, and if that's not vindication at the highest levels, I don't know what is. So, 130 years after his death, uh, it is now Saint John Henry Newman, and to conclude my remarks, but also I hope provide a springboard for the remarks later in the week, I want to give the final word to Pope Benedict XVI, in that homily he preached at that unique beatification mass. Pope Benedict said this, the definite service to which blessed, now Saint John Henry, was called, involved applying his keen intellect and his prolific pen to many of the most pressing subjects of the day. His insights into the relationship between faith and reason into the vital place of revealed religion in civilized society, and into the need for a broadly based and wide ranging approach to education, were not only of profound importance for Victorian England, but continue to inspire and enlighten many all over the world. What better way to express the joy of this moment than by turning to our Heavenly Father in heartfelt thanksgiving praying in the words that John Henry Newman placed on the lips of the choirs of angels in heaven, praise to the holiest in the height, and in the depth be praise. In all his words most wonderful, most sure, in all his ways. Thanks very much.